Well, the, the Australian um, side of, of this uh, project, which is Anna's project, um, started about two years ago. In the last 10 years, I've been working with the Aboriginal people, some of the most impoverished uh, communities um, that are 1,000 kilometres or 1,500 kilometres in the central desert, far from any uh, major town uh, from central Australia. What fascinates me about the, the Aboriginal people is the way they've lived for the last uh, 20, 30, 40,000 years, um, have lived off the land, um, are totally connected in a, in a spiritual way to the land. They've become part of the land in, a, in an extraordinary way. I guess I, my interest in, in Aboriginal culture more than anything else uh, it wasn't a, a money thing, it was more of a, a passion um, to learn about, um, about the culture um, that's right there in front of our doorstep um, that not many people know about. The most known story about Aboriginal art is that it's, um, uh, it's a topographical um, of the artists painting their lands and the areas where they came from, uh, where they were born, significant sites that are important in their, in their culture, um, different for men and women uh, also. Um, I guess when when Aboriginal, the modern contemporary Aboriginal art started um, in the early 70s, it, was, um, it became uh, like an outpouring of, uh, of emotions um, that the Aboriginal people couldn't convey in another way with language because of their language skills. And I guess they uh, wanted to show their heart to, um, to, to the world, to, to the Australian people that didn't understand them. They paint uh, their significant sites, um, they paint their culture, um, they paint uh, areas where they were born, where they were raised. They paint to keep the, the dreamings alive, their mythological stories of, uh, of their dreamings, um, the most important things in their culture um, as a, a form of preservation, I guess, into a, into a canvas. Um, but in another way, then we have uh, other artists who have moved on into a more contemporary area. Um, that, uh, that paint in a more contemporary style and have moved away from, um, from the Aboriginal um, uh, styles and, um, and, and designs that they would um, paint on their bodies uh, during ceremonies. Um, but having said that, I think they still, um, the, the essence of their, of their culture is still there in all of their paintings. It's, uh, it's basically, uh, it can be seen as a, uh, as a picture um, without words. But they keep these things alive through their stories and through their dreamings from, that are passed on um, religiously from, um, from their grandparents to the parents to the children that goes on and on. And one thing I found most fascinating was that um, the story of the dreamings never changes uh, word for word. It's identical. Wherever you hear it, you will hear the identical story of, um, of what's happened um, uh, in their dreamings. And, um, I guess it's part of uh, keeping their culture alive. They have their own um, interpretation of, uh, of great events that have happened um, on Earth uh, since 50,000 years ago. Um, some of the stories that you hear about um, uh, are of biblical proportions, um, something like the, when the ice caps melted eight to 10,000 years ago and the waters rose uh, in Australia um, uh, and I guess the sea came inland from 25 to 35, 40 kilometres, um, as scientists have proven these days. Um, they have their own interpretation of, of, of what really happened, and um, this is part of the dreaming. In the, in the early days, they would have painted on bark um, or on rocks in caves, um, mostly with ochres, the white, the yellow, the red, um, brown and black charcoal. Um, it was in 1971 that they were uh, first given the acrylic paints uh, on small boards, um, you know, uh, 50 centimetres by 50, and they started using the acrylic paints. Um, and it, it went on from there. I mean, it, um, it was basically trying to get them uh, to, to do their traditional um, paintings on a board, and it went on from there, and it developed into a, into a com contemporary art movement um, it's probably one of the biggest movements in the world today. I consider myself an ambassador for, um, for Aboriginal art and the communities that I've been initiated into. I think it needs to be on the international level and that's what I'm striving for these days. I guess it's my uh, desire to, to learn that um, uh, 
leaves me open to be able to communicate with people on a, on a different level um, because I, I really want to learn and I really have a deep interest in, um, in learning about them. Um, and I guess after meeting quite a few of them, I was struck by their, their lifestyle, their, um, their sense of what life is and, and how they've lived for, for thousands of years um, off the land. Um, they're free spirits, totally free, uh, innocent like five-year-old children. Um, not to say that they don't, uh, they're not very intelligent, but um, they have a, a purity that um, I really couldn't find uh, today in, in many places of the world. Um, and that really uh, struck me as um, incredible and um, made me want to know them more and more. And I guess being involved and being a representative of their, um, of their art and their culture, uh, especially after becoming initiated, I sort of felt a, a moral obligation to be able to take um, uh, their, their art to the world. As we've seen in the past with the, um, with the American Indigenous people and, and the Canadians and the New Zealanders, um, I guess the, um, the last people to come out from their traditional life are the Australian Aboriginals. Um, it's been a, a very difficult uh, issue with, um, with the Australian government. I guess they've tried in, their, um, in the best way they could uh, to try and get the people to assimilate in a, in a Western way of life, uh, while at the same time um, trying uh, to push them towards cultural preservation as well, not to, um, to blow out the, the flame that's still burning in the central desert. With the younger generation, I guess they're caught in a in an area that you'd probably call uh, no man's land. They're caught in between their traditional lifestyles and their beliefs, and then I guess through television and media and what they see in the, in the bigger towns, they're caught up in the Western way of life. So I have a hard time grasping both worlds in trying to fit them together, and I guess um, a lot of the problems stem um, from, uh, from that into trying to assimilate themselves into the Western world. And, um, not being very successful at it. The Aboriginal people tend to share everything they get. No matter how much uh, money they get from whatever they do, whether it's painting, um, it's gone in one day. It's shared totally between the community. They have a lot of lessons for us uh, in, in the way of life, um, in the way they live um, uh, for us in Western society. There are definitely artists that are painting for their communities to look after their children. It's a, it's a, form, of, uh, it's a form of income um, that a lot of people have taken on board. Um, then I guess there are artists who, um, who are more serious, the second tier, um, more serious about their art and what they paint and how they viewed and how they view their own art, um, how they're viewed in their communities. Um, and I guess then there is the, the upper echelon of, um, of the Aboriginal artists uh, that uh, don't paint for money. Um, Tommy Watson, for example, does not use any of his money, all the money goes to the communities. He's not an artist that will paint for the sake of painting to sell something to somebody. When he feels like painting, he will sit down and paint. Um, he takes pride in the fact that he doesn't paint for money, as he once said, like all those other fellas. If I did that, then my art would not be true. Tommy Watson holds the record in Australia for a living artist for a painting done in 2007. Um, he first came into prominence in 2003 in, a, in an exhibition in Alice Springs. Um, everybody recognised that this was an exceptional talent. Um, I began, began to work with him in 2004 and um, we, um, we had a special relationship where when I was initiated I went through tribal law, as they call it, as his son um, and um, was initiated by all his relatives so I became part of part of the family group, which I'm still part of today. Um, I, I guess his works have been um, the most uh, internationalised, I would probably say. Uh, the style that is, uh, I guess, uh, he's been compared to Kandinsky um, quite, quite a bit by, by many um, important people in the art world. You have to, once you stand in front of a Tommy Watson painting, you realise the importance of this artist. It's very hard to convey in words unless you stand in front of a, one of his works and, and feel the energy of his paintings. My first meeting with Luciano was in Sydney. We had um, quite 
uh, a conversation about Aboriginal art and it's obvious that Luciana has a, has a dream and a vision um, for all cultures in, in the whole world uh, as with the project with the Piccolini. But uh, I, think, I think there is a, a small part that, uh, that makes it feel a little bit more special that uh, he thinks uh, there is something more there to be learned from the Aboriginal culture in the paintings um, as opposed to Western art. I'm thrilled to be working um, with such a, a special person on this um, on this project that has yet to um, uh, yet to flower, I guess. And I think it's only in the future that we'll see the importance of the Piccolini project. <laughs>